My name is Simon Parker, and as a travel writer and journalist, I've reported from some of the most extreme corners of the planet. I've sailed across ferocious oceans and trekked through some of the highest mountain ranges in an effort to document the power of Mother Nature. Been absolutely destroyed by a landslide. But now I'm embarking on my next epic journey at the gentle pace of a bicycle. From high above the Arctic Circle at the summit of Norway to the foot of the Scandinavian Peninsula in Sweden. Wow! Over the course of my 2,000 mile adventure, I'll be learning about the natural cycles of the region as a green and fertile summer slides into the frozen grips of winter. I'll be searching for seasonal foods and elusive wild animals with the people that call this place their home. I'm passing through at a time of harvest and splendor and I'm seeing it all on two wheels. This is Earth Cycle. I'm on the southern edge of Lapland, cycling through Sweden's vast and often frozen northern wilderness. Up here, the transition between summer and winter is a brief but extremely fertile period in the year, a mere moment in the annual life cycle of the natural world that I can see transforming subtly around me. On this leg of my adventure, I'll be spending more long and strenuous days in the saddle as I traverse through the never-ending forests of northern Europe. I'll meet some of the humans that call this epic landscape their home and, with a bit of luck, catch a glimpse of some of Scandinavia's weird but equally wonderful creatures. Sweden's two northernmost counties, Norrbotten and Vesterbotten, cover a whopping 38% of the country's entire area. But despite their vast dimensions, just half a million people choose to call this region their home in a space that could fit in Denmark, the Netherlands and Switzerland combined. The further south I cycle though, the more signs of life I'm encountering, even if that does mean jostling for space on a road beside hundreds of massive vehicles. There's always a decision to be made on these journeys, move quicker on busy roads, or try my luck on the considerably quieter but often bumpier scenic route. I took a gamble and I'm slightly embarrassed to say that gamble hasn't paid off at all. These roads are absolutely horrendous. And whereas on the motorway I was able to go about 15 or 20 miles per hour, that's almost 30k an hour, on this road I'm just creeping along and I'm really not sure what damage it's going to do to my ricketing bike. On adventures like these, the road less travelled can often prove to be the most interesting. And while I confess to being just a little bit lost, there are certainly worse places to be. Well, it's been about 500 miles or so, about 800 kilometers since I last saw the ocean. But now, after a pretty hard slog across the entire width of the Scandinavian peninsula, I'm here next to the Gulf of Bothnia, which is only about 300 meters away. The Bothnian Bay, or Gulf of Bothnia, is the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. And while some commercial fishing does take place in the icy waters stretching towards Finland, a few resourceful locals fish on its northeast banks using techniques that are centuries old. Curtin Hans return to this exact stretch of river every single year during just a brief four-week window between summer and winter. This is when one of Scandinavia's lesser known and certainly weirdest fish migrates from the river to the sea. They can obviously sense that I'm not the most experienced of fishermen, but nevertheless they are keen to make me look and feel the part at least. Thank you very much. They, they are old. These are old also. This is okay. This old, also old. <laughs> <laughs> you see, here, they come in here, in, 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 in to that hole. Into the hole and they can't get out. Exactly. And in the morning then we just take this up. Let me see. Oh. And you made these? H C. That's Hasse Carlson. That was Hans and he made these in 2011. Yeah. Wow, it's quite a, a hefty piece of kit. Mm -hmm. I've never seen Anything. a fishing net quite like this. No. And we have them in, in many, you see that one? 
A bucket. I'm actually being some use now. Yeah. Okay, that's locked on there pretty well. This is pretty heavy work. These massive slippery boulders, very hard to get purchase on, but they're necessary in the whole operation because they're using them to weigh down the nets. Hans is 71 and he's still out here almost every day lifting these big rocks and he's battling with rapids like this. And I've asked him, does he have any intention of retiring and giving this up? And he said, not a chance. Have your family fished in this river for a long time? Of course. I have been fishing with his father and his, he has been fishing with my father and my grandfather fished. It's experiences like this which seem to be punctuating this whole journey. Meeting people who are harvesting things which are going on at this very abundant time of year. I've seen it throughout my journey. And to come somewhere like this, this incredible riverscape, this landscape, as this water just carves the way through Scandinavia. This is unforgettable. I really will never forget this experience. Well, it's been a long and incredibly wet night. To be getting back in this river right now seems like the most ridiculous thing. It's now time to roll back the heavy boulders and retrieve the dozens of wooden nets that we set last night. This is the Arctic lamprey, a parasitic species that feeds off other fish and unsurprisingly has figured as a much maligned and feared part of local folklore for thousands of years. Oh my goodness. They are like a fish meets an eel meets a snake. I have honestly never seen an animal quite like that. You can see they have this strange sucker-like mouth which actually leeches on to other fish. Very strange animals. Now I'm going to head back to Hans's house to see exactly what he does with them. Millions of these slimy, snake-like creatures worm their way downstream every autumn. And while the locals used to have a taste for them many decades ago, these days their appeal is nowhere near as broad. And I've got to be entirely honest, now that I've seen them in the flesh, it's not hard to see why. It's only mm -hmm. the big ones you want to smoke yes. and take to market. Yeah. That's a big one, surely. Yep. This is salted water because now the lamprey go in and they go through this stage of being salted. So these are the lamprey once they've been smoked. Yes. How long are they smoked in here? 36 hours. 36 around. hours. Yes. They've taken on an entirely different colour, this kind of silvery gold appearance and they have this smoky aroma akin to a, a smoked mackerel or a, a smoked salmon. They actually smell quite appetising. Thankfully Hans's house is warm and dry and all that wrestling with heavy boulders has certainly made me work up an appetite. But I've got to confess, the idea of eating these things is something I've been dreading for the past 24 hours. So here goes, this is what it's been all about. Mm. It's surprisingly fishy. I thought because it came from the river, it would have more of a, a muddy taste. But actually, it's fishy, it's salty, and it tastes healthy. Mm. That's a totally different texture. Very chewy. Mm. It's not bad, but I think I definitely prefer this, the baked ones. You say so. The fresh ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate your hospitality. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so I probably won't be eating lamprey anytime soon, but I have got a belly full of potatoes and that certainly goes down as another quirky Scandinavian pastime that I feel privileged to have experienced firsthand. Now I just hope I can find a route through Sweden that works. I'm sticking on the highways, but they're absolutely awful for cycling on. The hard shoulder is pretty much non-existent and no one seems to care that I'm here at all. And I'm really starting to fear for my safety. I'm gonna have a cup of coffee, calm down a little bit and try and come up with some sort of solution. I'm sat here and I'm totally racking my brains because I have no idea as to where I should go from now. The motorways, the e-roads which I've been following, they're very direct, but they only seem to be single lane motorways and that's what makes them so dangerous. Um, there are yellow roads I could follow which will be sealed, but they take huge detours and I'm really not sure if I'm up for that. Coming up, I'm meeting some of the people who call Sweden's high coast their home and finding out why autumn is the very best time for photography, before then cycling on ever further south in a bid to spot one of the planet's biggest rodents. I'm exploring Sweden's soggy northeast corner and I'm following the coastline of the Gulf of Bothnia. I've been finding out how the locals catch and preserve one of the strangest fish in Europe, a delicacy with an acquired taste that I'm not sure I'll be returning to anytime soon. But now I'm back on the bumpy road and cycling through avenues of lofty spruce trees and mile upon mile of lush farmland packed with friendly livestock. I am seeing more signs of life but that doesn't stop me being amazed at quite how extreme and exposed this region often feels. On a day like today, where it's actually really starting to feel rather cold, cooking up some rice, some sausages, and some tomatoes next to this little beach is really good for morale because it's turning into really tough miles on the bike and it's really good to have a morale boost like this every now and then. It really feels like I've been on the road forever without taking a break. I've covered almost a thousand miles now, that's well over 1500 kilometers. And now I'm about to take a rare afternoon off to meet some people who really are embracing that change between summer and autumn. Every September, Thousands of like-minded, adventurous Scandinavians descend upon Utfest on Sweden's high coast to cherish and explore the natural world around them. Its founder, Jerry Engström, used to live and work in the capital Stockholm, but then he dreamt up the idea of upping sticks and moving north, a region where seasonal change is appreciated in all its minute details. Well, this is the fourth year we are kind of celebrating the end of summer and the coming of autumn. When the temperatures start dropping around 10 degrees as average, that's when we call autumn in Sweden at least. And now we actually have that. So this is, we're in the middle of the shift and you can see the smiling faces around us. I mean, this is something that we should celebrate because right now colors are popping up and there's tons to do. Cooking classes, mushrooms in the woods, the berries are kind of really tasty. <laughs> Climbing, hiking, kayaking. It's a place for inspiration also and sharing memories, ideas, uh, tips of where to go. So this is a highlight of the year. Perhaps the biggest seasonal changes of all though are those that are happening in the forest canopies above us. And while Scandinavia is undeniably picturesque all year round, most people agree that autumn is when this landscape is at its most glorious. And local photographers like Arna are poised to record this brief transition on film. Is it a nice experience, an enjoyable experience for you to take your camera and to disappear into the wilderness? What do you love about that? It's, it's good exercise. Being out in the wilderness makes you just feel strong and, and uh, 
clear in the brain and everything. But it's also like, uh, it's like meditation. Just sitting somewhere in the nature and, and see the weather pass by and the clouds drift by and uh, yeah, it, it really makes something to your whole soul. So what's special for you about this time of year in terms of the colour and the look of this place? I think it's really fascinating to see the nature change, to see the, the colour of the leaves change, uh, to feel that the atmosphere in the nature is changing. When you can go and see the morning mist in the valleys, and you can, you can really hear the sound is also changing. The birds are moving and it's getting more quiet. It's really superb for photography. Tuning in to the subtle shift of seasons is exactly what this adventure is all about. And from the perspective of a bicycle, I'm seeing this wild region transform at a refreshingly gentle pace. The air is crisp with the first signs of winter, yet I can still smell the sweet perfume of summery roadside flowers amid the earthy scent of autumn's browning leaves. I'm pushing on ever further south into Sweden's vast forested centre strewn with icy lakes, but despite the stunning scenery around me, I'm exhausted and finding it hard to put one pedal in front of the other. I am really struggling and it's really dawning on me that this is not just a journalistic pursuit, that this is a, an endurance feat in its own right. And I've been on the bike now for about eight or nine hours and there's just hill after hill after hill and I'm surviving pretty much solely on sugar and that's just not working. I'm starting to crash now. I'm desperate for a good meal, but I've pretty much run out of all of my food. This is a massive challenge. This part of my journey was always going to be the hardest physically. I'm trying to cover between 80 and 100 miles a day, and despite entering the significantly more populated region of central Sweden, the distance between towns is still often massive, especially considering I'm now so exhausted I'm creeping along at about seven miles per hour. Often I'm not seeing another human being for an hour or two at a time, and when a shop does eventually come along, I have to stock up on enough food to keep me going for what could be a day or two. Peanuts, perfect for energy. Bananas, definitely. On trips like these, I find myself surviving on huge amounts of carbohydrates. Bread, pasta, rice and cakes. Literally anything to keep me pedalling and moving forward. And today has been particularly gruelling. I've cycled 93 miles, that's 150 kilometres, and I'm in a desperate need of a rest. Now this has been an extremely long day and I had absolutely no idea where I was going to end up. But this place looks amazing. Undercover, right next to the lake. Extremely cool. Regardless of how tired I might be at the end of an exhausting day, it's amazing how a hot meal and a good night's rest can leave me waking up eager to do it all again. This region of Sweden is covered in deep snow for half of the year, meaning that right now the animals that live here are hurriedly preparing for the big freeze just around the corner. I'm hoping Jan is the man to help me catch a glimpse of this in the flesh. He's been studying these rivers and one particularly furry species of rodents for decades. Hello. <laughs> Nice to meet you, I'm Hi. Simon. Hi, I'm Jan. So this is, this is what we're taking out? Yes, the, the boat. <laughs> Rubber boat with an electric engine. Once we're on the water, it's easy to see why Jan uses such a lightweight electric powered boat. It allows us to move almost entirely in silence, making it perfect for sneaking up on the skittish creatures that call this river their home. We are in a river called Hedströmmen and we are uh, soon coming to the first beaver lodge that can be found in this water. What's so special about the, the beaver species? What do you love so much about them? 
They are very social, they live in family groups, they uh, leave maybe the clearest the tracks and signs that you can find in the, in, in, the, in the forest. I mean, they can cut down this big aspen trees just with their teeth. And they build uh, dams and they build uh, lodges. So uh, it's a fantastic animal that's really interesting to study and to see. I've spent a lot of time to, to film them and to photograph them. And I do a lot of beaver tours and it's always very, very fun. Is this a special time of year for beavers and their annual cycle and their seasonal cycle? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is uh, uh, September now and they are uh, uh, very active and because they need to store food for winter. They store food in the outside their lodge and uh, also inside the lodge because the uh, lake and the river will be uh, covered with ice in a few months here. Jan, what is here? Uh, that's the first beaver lodge. can be hard to, to spot, but uh, the, it's this uh, pile of yeah. branches. Yeah. That's because that the entrance is wow. underwater. Look at this. Look at right, this. right here is the entrance. So obviously we are looking for these big furry animals, but what else should I be trying to spot? What sort of things do they do? How do they, how do they move in the water? We will uh, follow the left side of the lake here because that's where we usually find them and they are always swimming close to the bank so look for something that moves close to the bank and you will probably only see the head it looks like a little bit like a floating coconut so that's that what you should look for floating <laughs> coconut a floating coconut this is a very fresh piece of gnawed bark. As you can see, they haven't left any of the bark. They have eaten absolutely all the bark. And you can see gnaw marks, marks of the, of the teeth. These teeth must be razor sharp. I am really desperate to see a beaver, but if we don't actually see one, just being out here is the most peaceful experience. The water is so incredibly still and this is without doubt probably the most placid place I've been on this entire trip. After their near extinction in the late 19th century, Eurasian beavers have been slowly reintroduced to central Sweden, and now their numbers are steadily on the rise, with over 150,000 living in the wild. They spend the warmest months of the year building and repairing their lodges, but it's right now at the end of summer when they're trying to hoard enough fresh branches to keep them fed throughout the winter. Watching them scurry and lollop on the muddy banks of the river they're certainly not the most graceful of land mammals. But then, as they slip into the water, they seem to take on an entirely different guise. Gliding effortlessly and propelled by their large rudder-like tails, before then disappearing underwater with a sudden dramatic splash. As the sun sets on this exhausting portion of my adventure, I'm left in awe of these gruff but graceful creatures living right in the heart of Sweden. Next time, I ride on further south in the hope of finding Scandinavia's largest land mammal, before then taking to the water and investigating a vital island project that's attempting to save one of its smallest but most important insects. <laughs> <laughs>